Hi, Squitch Hill. Uh, Tamsin at SNAT. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Tam Lutz. I'm a member of the Lummi Nation, and I'll be the facilitator for today. I'm the MCH Programs Director at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and we want to welcome you to our launch, our number one session of the Maternal Child Health Echo. Um, we hope uh, over this hour, we'll be able to provide some opportunities to engage with each other, um, to kind of learn peer to peer. Uh, today's uh, session, we'll be looking at um, uh, improving communication or uh, improving communication uh, regarding vaccine hesitancy. Uh, while there's lots to talk about uh, around uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy, we'll really be uh, looking at building knowledge and trust today. We have um, uh, faculty I'd like to introduce. Allison Empey, our lead uh, faculty, is a pediatrician, a Grand Ronde tribal member. Um, she's the, uh, she's a part-time tribal health clinic pediatrician and part-time deputy director at OHSU Center of Excellence uh, for their uh, YEAST program that uh, prepares uh, Native uh, students for the rigor of medical school. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, an additional fac faculty member, Don Ray Bankston, and she's a, a pediatric nurse practitioner who has uh, worked in public health and migrant health and international health and over the last nine years has worked at the Quinal Indian Nation as uh, one of their pediatric, pediatric providers before joining the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Um, it, this being our first echo, um, we will have additional sessions each month. Um, so be sure to fill out the evaluation at the end to provide us with some feedback, um, what sessions you'd like to see in the future. Um, and uh, just bear with us as we learn how to do this together. Uh, Dr. Empey will review a case, uh, a community case. We will have a case form for folks that are interested in, in providing one. Um, there will be an opportunity to provide an individual case for a patient or a community or systems case to, to uh, provide to us to uh, incorporate into our monthly ECHO. Um, then for today, our case will, our community case uh, that Dr. Empey presents will be followed by two presentations, one by um, Dr. Uh, Thomas Weiser, who we know well at the health board, he's been here uh, uh, well, he's been in IHS for over 20 years, and he's been at the health board since 2007. He's been very involved as our medical epidemiologist, but also leading our immunization program at the board, as well as uh, representing uh, in various uh, state, uh, regional, and national uh, venues. Also, we'll having, have uh, Dr. Ryan Hassan, a pediatrician, um, uh, at Oregon Pediatrics and a um, member of the Boost Oregon Board, and uh, he'll be presenting uh, the larger didactic presentation about addressing vaccine hesitancy. So, Allison, do you want to take it away? Oh, and chat if you have questions into the chat box. And we'll have somebody monitoring that for Allison as she is presenting the case. Wonderful. Um, let's see if we can move on to the next page. Um, so it's so wonderful to see uh, so many faces, some that I um, look familiar and recognize. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm just going to share um, kind of a presentation from my experience um, working at tribal, um, my tribal clinic. So it's a family medicine pediatrics clinic. It's within a tribal community here in the Pacific Northwest. And there is some vaccine hesit hesitancy that I've found um, surrounding vaccines, especially um, when we have brought up influenza, HPV, and also the childhood vaccine schedule. 
Um, so particularly um, when we're talking about the influenza vaccine, um, I've heard in the past and even starting this year, um, I've gotten sick when I received in the past, so my family doesn't get it. So really concerns over what is included in the vaccine and some hesitancy around mistrust of both, of both healthcare and big pharma. Um, and then for HPV, I've really heard a few of my family members got it and now they can't have children. And so there's hesitancy around um, concern for infertility and especially trust having to do possibly with some historical trauma there. Um, and so what are ways that we are working on this and are there any barriers, obstacles, or challenges? Um, so, uh, sorry, and particularly, I think it might have cut off some of the concerns, I apologize, um, for the less than two-year-old kind of the vaccine schedule. Um, but what I've seen with hesitancy around that um, is families being concerned that they're giving vaccines too early or that, um, you know, my child, it's too many pokes all at once. I don't think they can handle that. Um, so also some hesitancy there around um, uh, kind of trusting um, and mistrust of the healthcare system in general. Um, so what has worked in the past? Um, so things that we've worked on has kind of been implementation of well child visits. Um, so not just um, kids coming in for acute, but making sure we're getting them in um, based on the American Academy of Pediatrics um, well child visit recommendations, um, but also a vaccine opportunity at every visit. Um, we have also, as many, I'm sure many clinics um, across um, the United States have seen kind of this drop off in vaccines having to do with COVID. We had to shut down our clinic for a number of times. And so we actually um, did a, uh, just, just a clinic um, for vaccines where families just came in for vaccines. Um, and then we're continuing to build trust with the community um, by having kind of these open discussions during clinic visits. And often I will add it to the problem list when they have vaccine hesitancy. So it right, reminds me to bring it up each and every time they come into clinic so we can continue the conversation um, and include kind of what of their thoughts around that. Um, and then there have been some um, community meetings around vaccine hesitancies um, to hear community concerns and ask answer questions that they may have had. Um, so particularly Head Start, um, they had uh, me come in and kind of uh, invited families to come and ask questions that they had. And so um, what opportunities, so kind of looking towards the future, hopefully the near future, what should we be doing in order to gain trust in our communities surrounding vaccines? Hesitancy with the potential of COVID um, vaccine coming out soon and kind of how do we gain trust in the community while acknowledging some of this historical trauma that our communities have faced um, with mistrust with the healthcare system, with big pharma or with research? So that's, uh, that's my case um, that I have here today. I wanted to um, open up any questions from the audience about this or any thoughts. Dr. Mp, um, what were your thoughts about how well the um, the vaccine specific clinics went where they were just centered around those and folks were coming in for those? Um, I, those went, um, those went pretty well. Um, it was kind of a, a drive in uh, type thing. They would drive in, they would call us. We actually held it off site um, from, from where our clinic was located. Um, we had an off site for that, which um, I think decreased um, some of the fear that families were having about coming to clinic, um, especially during that uh, beginning of when COVID um, was happening. Um, and the families made appointments. They were spread out very far so that families were able to come in, get their vaccines, get out. We cleaned, you know, we're able to clean everything um, before the next family um, arrived. Um, and I think it was a good opportunity too for some like community health was there too um, for resources too. We have a couple questions in the chat. One of them is, how do you address uh, when there is someone in the community who is spreading either 
misinformation or just alternative views uh, about vaccines in the schedule? Um, that That is a great question. Um, I think it's it's more difficult when you don't have the opportunity to interact with the community member. And so that's why I think it was really a great idea that um, we have a couple different uh, Head Start and then um, I believe it's Community Health has invited us to do more community-wide events um, where people can bring concerns forward and kind of uh, hear um, from the uh, healthcare providers um, who are, you know, leading that. And so I think that's a good way um, to address that at that level. I have oh. heard, oh, sorry. <laughs> I've oh. also heard folks talk uh, from the Washington American Indian Health Commission talking about tribes being prepared to have their own social media plans and providing factual information to help combat that. That's great. Yeah, that's a great idea. Are there any other questions from faculty about this case before we kind of uh, turn over to maybe some solutions? There's another question in the chat that says, um, there is a semi-retired pediatrician and wondering if there might be a volunteer opportunity at community clinics. That is a great question. I will, I will get back to that one. Um. And then there are a couple of comments from Dr. Hassan who says, um, really common concerns about HPV and flu. And he's seen um, several, of, uh, several of the same things with his patients. And then also uh, love the practice of putting vaccine declined in the problems list. Great. This, this is a tribal clinic. I, thought, I think I saw a question um, in the chat box. So this is Dr. Wise. I'll just chime in for a second. One of the things we did a number of years ago to try and um, <clears throat> increase the acceptability of flu vaccines was a project with Oregon um, I forget the name of the organization. It was a vaccine organization that helped Oregon and the Oregon Health Authority. But we, we got the uh, CDC's big uh, flu vaccine poster. And then we got the tribal logos from all the tribes. And we worked with an artist to put those tribal logos and other logos, the health board logo on that poster. And we had, you know, a thousand or more of those printed up. We still have a bunch. You get somebody in there to mail them out. Every year we try to mail out a bundle of them to each of the tribal clinics in Oregon. But that idea of co-branding with the tribal logo and the CDC's message, um, <clears throat> we thought that that might be really helpful. And we still think that it could be a good idea, but we haven't really studied it to see the impact that that might have. But uh, for people that we've talked with in focus groups who told us, you know, if it says you know, .gov on it, I don't read it because I don't trust the government. And so um, by having, you know, the tribal endorsement on there as well, uh, that might help um, as long as they trust their, their tribal leadership too. That's always, you know, depends on which side you're on there as well. I, I really like that idea, Dr. Weiser. I've seen um, with hepatitis C, um, with that campaign for getting uh, people tested. I've actually seen posters up that have our tribe and then uh, the Northwest Portland Indian Health Board, and I believe it's the CDC um, logos on them, but they also have photos of our, our uh, practitioners. Um, and so they're uh, hopefully trusted um, within the community. We are, we're very lucky to have uh, physicians who've been there for a number of years, um, but that's maybe an idea for uh, for the flu vaccine or other vaccines, having a trusted community member um, on posters. All right, we've kind of moved over to some uh, solutions. I wanted to open up uh, to anyone else who has some ideas.
Hi, this is Roberta. Um, and I'm in Portland. I'm a doula, community health worker, um, lactation educator. My community serve a lot of families of color, and I um, am one of those community members that has been leery of vaccines. Um, had a child that had a vaccine injury. Um, it has impacted my family's life. It's impacted, you know, how I um, spread out or decline vaccines for my children. Um, and in these times, I know that I see all the hard work that community is doing, and I have a duty to um, have current and updated information. So I, um, I think it's uh, one of the problem solving things is what I'm doing now as a provider um, is to um, come back to the conversation, open up my eyes, listen to the concrete new information, um, really see what's going on out there and really breaking, um, I guess, my experience is valid, but um, also this is valid as well. And so I have a responsibility to give people um, the current correct information out there so they can make their own educated decisions on their families and really promote and guide them to the places to keep their families safe. So that is one thing is to reach out to fellow providers and that might have these experiences and that are, are leery and, and, and get us all to move together for the safety of our people. It's the most, it's really important. Roberta, I love that you're here and um, that you are open with that and that we're having this discussion. So welcome. There are a couple comments in the chat. Um, the, the first being uh, the potential to translating information into tribes languages to break language barriers um, and help them feel more comfortable. And then uh, also having a strong working relationship between uh, our Head Start program and our tribal clinic has built a lot of trust among preschool families. Good, great. I'm just jotting uh, some of these down. They're great ideas. Okay. I, I was just going to uh, mention too, Roberta, I really appreciate also what you shared. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing when I was, you know, the families that I worked with, um, you know, it seemed like a lot of the misinformation on the internet is, is really detrimental. So I would sit down and have a really good discussion and try to um, show the research-based, um, you know, the actual studies that have been done, um, you know, to kind of help them make, make their decisions um, and work through some of that. Um, but that's, that's one of the challenges. But, you know, I think as um, Dr. Anthony mentioned about building that trust with your healthcare provider um, is so important because if they feel like they can trust you, then they'll, they'll trust hopefully, um, you know, some of the information that you share with them. So, so thank you for sharing that. So we've heard some really um, innovative ideas um, for addressing some of the vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing specifically in tribal communities. Um, and it seems the common theme here is trust. Um, and so working on that trust to begin with um, and getting ahead of information um, before it can spread um, in the community. And so I just wanna thank everyone for those ideas and solutions that I'm you know, gonna take some of those back um, with me. Um, so I think we'll move on to our cases now unless there's any more comments. Great, All right. thank you. Um, and uh, you, continue, you can continue to add more comments into the chat and we will be able to share those. Um, Dr. Weiser, would you like to start us off? Sure, that would be fine. Um, you got the slides there, great. All right, and so Candace, I'll just uh, have you run the slideshow, that'd be great. Um, so anyway, I, I'm going to try and go through this, um, maybe not too, I don't want to rush through it, but I also don't want to spend too much time, so I want to get to Ryan's talk. Some of you have maybe heard parts of what I'm going to share already. I've done parts of this almost all summer long, it seems like three or four times. 
And um, so if you've heard it before, um, you can go get a cup of coffee or something and come back. <laughs> and we'll go to the next slide. Here's my disclaimer. This doesn't represent any health service. I have no conflicts. Next one. Okay, next. So we'll focus first on um, routine immunizations across IHS. Um, we have a system called the National Immunization Reporting System where sites uh, can run a quarterly report and then upload that report to this um, uh, web-based reporting system. And then uh, we're able to um, create you know, graphs like this from that data and get some idea of how we're doing. And if you look at this, this goes all the way back to 2011. And this is for the, the fully immunized two-year-old measure. So uh, what we call 4313314. So that means they've gotten all the doses for this set of vaccines. And if I can remember it, it's four DTaP, three Hep B, one varicella, three uh, Hib, three polio, one MMR and four Prevnar. So um, maybe not, maybe some of the threes I got in the wrong order, but that's, you get the idea. So they should have had all the doses of all those vaccines in order to be considered fully vaccinated up to date by the age of two. And uh, you can see that in the beginning of this time period, we started off hovering around 80%, which is the Healthy People 2020 goal. So we were there, and the closer we got to 2020, the, the, the further away we got from the goal, which is kind of odd, isn't it? Uh, we would hope that we could maintain that high level of vaccination. But beginning in around 2016, we dropped down to about 70%, and then now we're down to around 60%. Um, and so there's been this trend in, in decreasing childhood immunization coverage across IHS now, going back these last four years. And in each area, if you look at the area-specific data, uh, you'll see that it's different. Um, next slide. And so we put together this data because um, we were concerned when the report came out um, in the MMWR showing that there was a decrease in um, childhood vaccine, vaccines being acquired by VFC providers. So they were ordering less childhood vaccines um, starting in about March because fewer people were coming in uh, to get their vaccines because of COVID. And then there was also data from um, some Sentinel sites that show there was actually a decrease in administration of childhood vaccines as well. So what this data looks at is our um, quarterly data beginning the first quarter begins on October 1st through December 31st, the second quarter, and then the third quarter. And the third quarter really is that quarter that is uh, primarily um, April 1st through June uh, 30th. So that's really the, the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic in our country and the period of time where we were most concerned to see if there was a decrease. And you can see uh, for each of the areas and for IHS nationally, the first set of bars, um, that there wasn't a dramatic decrease in most of our areas in that third quarter. A couple of areas have, are exceptions. Um, but for the most part, most of our areas were able to maintain vaccination rates um, at or near the level that they were normally vaccinating at. So while there's a national concern that this really dropped off dramatically, from the data we've been able to collect so far, uh, we're not seeing that across the board in Indian country, but in some areas there have been some decreases. And it's certainly something we need to pay attention to um, because it's a very, a very real concern uh, when patients can't get into clinic because of decreased clinic operations because of COVID um, or because they're afraid that if they bring their child to the clinic, they will get COVID. Uh, those are real concerns that um, parents and families have. Next slide. So I'm going to turn now to influenza. And um, <clears throat> this graph just shows a graph of influenza-like illness. And you see um, in the green line is the 2018-2019 season, and the blue line is the one we just completed, 2019 to 2020. And um, the bottom shows the, the CDC's week number, which um, the best I can do is tell you that week number one corresponds to January 1st, right? So um, you can find that spot on the graph. And so typically flu does peak um, after January 1st. A typical flu season, we have our peak 
maybe in February or March. Since the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, we've tended to have a little bit earlier peaks. And last year was, was um, one of the earliest ones we've seen where we had a, a, an early peak in um, about two to three weeks before the end of the year. And then it went down again. And then there was a second peak that we saw. And if you recall, we had influenza B circulating first last year, followed by influenza A. And that was kind of unusual too, because usually it's the other way around. But that being said, um, <clears throat> if influenza is going to start hitting us, you can see it begins to rise even in November. Um, if influenza activity is starting as early as November, then we need to get people vaccinated before the influenza activity starts. Otherwise, we're going to be behind the, behind the, the eight ball the whole time, and we're not going to be able to catch up. So the, the influenza vaccine does two things. It protects the person from getting severe illness from influenza. It may not protect them from, from getting any influenza illness, but it certainly helps people, uh, it helps decrease hospitalization risk and helps decrease the risk of death, especially in older persons. And uh, so that's why even though sometimes people do still get um, illness from influenza, even though they got vaccinated, they tend to get less severe illness and less likely to need hospitalization, less likely to die from it. The second uh, function I think of as an epidemiologist for vaccinating people against anything is to prevent outbreaks and epidemics. Every year we have a, an epidemic of influenza, every single year. And what we'd like to do is see enough people get vaccinated so that we don't have an epidemic in a community. And to do that, you need to reach herd immunity which for a normal, typical flu season is probably about 50% of the people would need to be vaccinated um, to reach some kind of herd immunity to maybe prevent an epidemic. Next slide. Well, this slide shows you the uptake of influenza vaccine. Um, <clears throat> and this is from a, a surveillance system that IHS operates. And um, so it doesn't include every site, but those sites that are reporting into the system and you see that beginning at about week 36 or 37, which is around the first week or so of October, is when we begin to start vaccinating. And we vaccinate really high, uh, uh, very steep level throughout the month of October. And then the, the second week or so of November, it starts to taper off and flatten off. And then um, it's pretty flat until um, partway through December. And then it usually picks up again after the first of the year particularly in children, because children go back to school after their Christmas break, and that's when they started finding out that, hey, you know, there's a bunch of kids coming back to school now who have influenza. Well, because maybe they traveled or they had family gatherings and they weren't vaccinated, and more, vac more influenza is spreading in those kinds of conditions. And we really hope that this year, with all the things we're doing to help prevent COVID, that it'll have some synergistic effect and help prevent um, influenza as well. And we saw that in the Southern Hemisphere from early data that we've been looking at. It shows that a lot of countries in the Southern Hemisphere who just finished their, their influenza season, they had a really mild, almost no influenza season this year. And it would be the combination of them getting vaccinated, but then also all the social distancing and masking and hand washing attention that people have been doing to prevent COVID. So, um, there was a really great call by CDC last week on the COCA series. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the things they, they, they do reinforce is that, you know, washing your hands, wearing a mask, uh, staying away from people, staying home when you're sick, all the things we tell people to do when they, you know, to prevent COVID, they work for flu too. The added bonus here is that we do have a vaccine that's safe, that's effective, and um, that's available. And so we really hope that we can um, have a, uh, our best ever flu vaccine year this year um, and really stress that you know, we can prevent influenza through these measures. And if we can prevent influenza, it means that there will be fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths from influenza and um, that'll preserve for the capacity of the healthcare system to continue responding to COVID as we know we need to do. Uh, next slide. Um, so this just shows uh, data, again, from that same system by area for different age groups and what percentage of them have received at least one dose of flu vaccine. And this is for last year's flu season. So nationally, you see that for children six months to 17 years, there was about 40% of those children 
had at least one dose. For adults 18 years and older, it was a little bit lower. I think it was about 36 or 37 percent. Seniors 65 and older had the highest uptake, just under 50 percent. And then um, all ages, all comers uh, was again around 38 um, percent. And you can see different areas have different levels. And again, this is a system that takes in data primarily from RPMS sites. Some of the non-RPMS sites can report into it. Um, so there, there might be uh, limitations there for the data, especially from Alaska and California, where very few sites use RPMS. Um, but of course, Tucson and uh, Navajo, um, they tend to every year be some of our highest vaccinated um, areas. Um, Tucson um, you just have a bullet story highly too? operated, um, but uh, is really going gangbusters there with over 60% of their children being vaccinated. Um, so that's really great to see. We'd love to see all of our areas reach that level. Okay, next slide. So this is a corny slide I put together with some bullet points attributed to these uh, stock photos that I got from the web. <laughs> These aren't real IHS providers. But the, the quotes are real from, from what we've heard from um, people um, who do vaccinations in Indian Health Service. So one of them is what we call max packing, um, which is when a patient comes in because they stubbed their toe, you review their chart for everything else that they need to get done, like their flu shot and like their colon cancer screening or their diabetes screening. And you offer all those services at the same time. We call max, we call that max packing. And that's really one of the things that we try to do. And, and, and during flu season, that means offering them a flu shot. And then um, um, also if a patient refuses, then the medical assistant would um, discuss that with the provider and let them know to bring it to their attention. A lot of times the MA, the medical assistant is the first person that they meet and you know they ask them their questions and hopefully the MA has been fully trained and educated about the benefits of flu vaccine or any vaccine. But if the person um, still is not, not interested, then they want to bring that to the next level. And that's where we, uh, it comes to the provider. Um, and you know, there are some people who are um, just kind of sitting on the fence. They're, they're not really sure about it. They've heard bad things. They've had bad experiences. And just the right amount of information can um, um, push them over into accepting the flu vaccine. Um, other things that we can do sort of systematically is running reports in RPMS or whatever EHR you're using that tells you who's been vaccinated, who's not been vaccinated. And you can call those people and let them know, hey, we've got our flu vaccines in, we're ready to, we're ready to provide that for you. Um, that works for children's vaccines too. Um, so we recommend uh, running reports every week to see which of your children are not fully vaccinated and calling them, sending them letters, and trying to get them in and get them up to date. If you do that every week, you can reach them before they fall so far behind that they would need to be on a uh, makeup schedule. Um, <clears throat> they can stay on the regular vaccine schedule, which is better. Uh, but if they fall too far behind, they'll have to get a makeup schedule, which is a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> and then again, you know, one of the most important um, uh, predictors of someone getting vaccinated is a strong recommendation by their provider. And just like we do with smoking, you just have to say it every single time, encouraging people, offering them the service, offering them a flu shot or whatever shots they might need, because, and, and following that up with a strong recommendation that this is really an important way to maintain your health. It works for smoking and it works for vaccines too. Um, and then again, and we're going to hear more about this from Ryan about how to communicate with people when there's vaccine hesitancy. And so I want to make sure I leave time for, for that discussion. Next slide. I think this is my last slide. And um, uh, some of these are bullet points I pulled from a previous presentation a few years ago, but they're still the same recommendations, things that you can do to build a successful flu vaccine campaign. Um, one of the things is uh, team-based care. So you have your nurse, your, um, your medical assistants, and your provider all working together as a team and supporting each other's efforts. Um, like I said before, checking for um, whether or not someone had their, their vaccines, including flu shots, at every visit. And not just in the primary care visits, but also eye clinic and dental visits and diabetes and all those. Um, 
So bring them all on board to help uh, offer those vaccines. Um, and then uh, we focus a lot during flu season on providing vaccines at out-of-clinic venues, these, these other places where we might be able to encounter our patients. Um, elder meetings, so sometimes they have uh, elder luncheons, um, daycares and Head Start facilities. The problem is a lot of these, these community venues are closed because of COVID. So this year, especially, it's going to be really challenging to reach out to those, <clears throat> those other venues. And I think it's going to make the drive-through clinic much more important than, um, <clears throat> than we have in the past. And I'm out here at Fort Hall today. This morning, uh, they had their first drive-through flu clinic. In about two hours, they vaccinated 120 people for influenza. It was the biggest, most successful um, drive-up clinic they've ever had. And um, I can tell you that I think that's going to be one of the the main things that we're going to be doing this year. Um, other things you can do is you can have a special clinic in your schedule added that's just uh, a nurse only clinic and anyone can walk in or can make an, a same day appointment to that clinic to get their flu shot, just increases access. They don't need to see a, a physician or a nurse practitioner um, just to get a flu shot. They can make their appointment through that nurse only clinic and that's a way of, of increasing access. Um, also, if there's a, a possibility to, to extend clinics to weekends or other things, that would work too. All right, I think my time's up. These slides can be made available to folks who want to go through that. And uh, I think I had one more, just a couple things to think about for planning for COVID-19. Um, there are a lot of moving parts to COVID-19 vaccination that we need to be thinking about. The American Health Commission, I think, is probably the leader of the pack when it comes to uh, resources and tools that I'd like to direct people to. Um, but these are some of the things that we really need to think about and we're gonna be asking sites to provide information to IHS or to the techs um, to help us plan and, um, and respond to these challenges that are gonna be uh, ahead of us with COVID-19 vaccine. So I'll turn it back to you, Tam, thanks. Yeah, and I believe somebody from the American Indian Health Commission is on the call and if they don't provide the link in the chat to their uh, vaccine preparedness um, uh, section of their website, we can also put that in there. And these um, slides will be available to everybody on the Indian Country Echo, MCH Echo section. And we'll hold questions till the end so that we can get Ryan on. Yep, there's the um, American Indian Health Commission um, link there. They have some great um, vaccine uh, preparedness and planning tools and spreadsheets that are very well developed and detailed and very easy to use if you haven't seen them already. So Ryan, if you wanna share your desktop with your presentation. All right, thanks very much, Tim. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Um, all right, well, I guess I'll just get started here. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, tried to make this uh, short and sweet and condense um, all the things I was asked to talk about to make it as uh, quick as possible. Um, so I'll try and get through it. And if there's time at the end for, for more, then we can go into that. Um, first off, thanks very much again for, for having me. I love being able to participate with this, with this, with this group and with this community um, and being able to uh, offer my own insights. And it's really exciting to see so many people here. Um, <clears throat> So starting off, I'd like to talk a little about myself. For those who haven't heard me speak before, this is me and my wife, Kristen. Um, we moved here to Portland a couple of years ago, three years ago now, um, to start working as a general pediatrician here in Happy Valley, where I live. Um, and I started working with Boost Oregon uh, as soon as I learned about them because I'm very passionate about um, public health, preventive medicine, and which means uh, getting people vaccinated, improving our vaccination rates, and reducing the burden of uh, vaccine preventable diseases, which is a major problem here in Oregon and a major problem, really gro growing problem globally in, in recent years. Um, so today in this talk, um, I'm going to focus a, on a few things a little differently than what I've normally talked about in the past. I'm going to briefly talk about um, kind of my general approach to how to uh, communicate effectively with parents about vaccines, um, how to have effective conversations that are useful, um, and a little bit about kind of why, that, why that's so important and why that hesitancy exists. Um, I'm gonna talk some specifically about why 
the flu vaccine in particular, it can be so challenging to talk about some of the unique um, things about the flu vaccine that make that conversation uh, a little bit different. Um, and then how COVID has affected our vaccine va uh, vaccination rates and how uh, the impact on, on vaccines in particular. And then talk a little bit about considerations for a COVID vaccine. Um, so Dr. Weiser's presentation was great and kind of touched on a lot of this already. I'll do what I can to avoid being redundant and try to add some uh, of uh, uh, my own uh, perspective to that. Um, so briefly, why do we vaccinate? Um, to short and sweet of it is vaccines are the safest, most well-studied uh, well medical intervention that we have. Um, they effectively reduce the risk for infection with and complications from the disease they target, and they prevent an estimated two to three million deaths worldwide each year, and they've saved billions of dollars in medical expenses. So cost-effective, keep people safe, very safe intervention, and save us a lot of healthcare dollars. So all great things. So why all the fuss? Why are there so many families who aren't sure, who are hesitant, um, who are worried about whether or not to vaccinate? Um, so this is, I think, a good way to sum things up. And this is, uh, you know, not applicable to everyone, but a, a basic tenant that I think is important to understand, not just for vaccine hesitancy, but for for all of us in all aspects of our lives for how we perceive information is this idea of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this is... Um, this is a bias that kind of um, belies the underlying biases and cognitive fallacies and logical fallacies that all of us are prone to in many ways in many other aspects of our lives. Um, and it's something that's been um, uh, touched on by many people throughout the years, even though the Dunning-Kruger effect itself wasn't called that until the 90s or so. Um, Charles Darwin said, you know, ignorance more frequently begets competence than does knowledge. Um, and these other simpler, uh, similar quotes say much the same thing. Um, and there's even a quote from the Bible in Proverbs, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. All of these quotes say essentially the same thing that when it's easy to mistake your knowledge or your perceived knowledge for wisdom, um, and it's easy to be overconfident in what we think we know. Um, so to expand on that, there's a great study called Unskilled and Unaware of It that I want to briefly talk about um, that I learned about when I was reading about this, um, the Dunning-Kruger effect that I find really interesting. So if any of you ever heard of MacArthur Wheeler, this was a man who uh, in the, in the 90s, he decided that he was going to rob a couple of banks, and he thought he would get away with it by making himself invisible. And he planned to do this and did do this by putting lemon juice on his face, because he learned that lemon juice is what's used to make invisible ink. So he thought if he put that on his face, he would be invisible to the security cameras. He somehow tested this by taking a picture of himself and somehow confirmed that it, he was invisible to the camera. So then he proceeded to rob two banks. And of course he was caught on video. They released, the police released the video. He was captured within a few hours and he was as perplexed at, being, at how he was caught as the police were at how he thought he couldn't be caught. Um, so Dunning and Kruger were two, um, two researchers who heard this story and wanted to explore this a little more and figure out why did this person who he wasn't an idiot he was you know he was a relatively normal intelligent guy but somehow he had this completely preposterous notion in his head and they wanted to figure out how could he come to this ridiculous idea um, so they did this study interviewed multiple people and they came and this graph kind of summarizes their findings that in general if you don't know absolutely anything about a topic, then you're not gonna have any confidence in your knowledge on that topic. But as soon as you start to have some knowledge or experience about it, you immediately gain a huge boost of confidence in your perceived knowledge of it. So you learn a few things and all of a sudden you think you know everything about that topic. And then once you learn some more things and you start to realize, actually this is more complicated than I thought, who thought healthcare was so complicated? Who thought vaccines were so complicated? And then you start to have a decrease in that confidence. And only once you start to have a significant level more experience does that level of confidence again rise. Um, so this is true for vaccine hesitancy as it is for any other aspect of, uh, of, of knowledge that we deal with. Um, and I think it's very important to note the 
the implications of this graph. You'll see at the very end of the graph, there's the level of confidence that experts have. There's a reason it's lower than the level of confidence over on that left side of the graph. Experts actually tend to be less confident in themselves than people who are completely ignorant of the field that the experts study. Um, and that tends to be because experts overestimate the knowledge of others, while amateurs or non-experts tend to overestimate their own knowledge. Um, so in general, it's a, if you are, it's a good sign that you're, you might be an expert at something if you question your own ability in it, um, which is when I was reading this, it made me feel a little bit more reassured because I always question when I'm asked to speak as an expert on vaccines, because I don't really think of myself as an expert on vaccines, um, which I guess is a good sign because if I were too confident in myself, then that might be a bad sign. So this is the Dunning-Kruger effect. I think, um, so this is David Dunning. He, in a, a recent article, uh, summarized the, his findings another way. And I really like this quote. An ignorant mind is precisely not a spotless empty vessel, but one that's filled with the clutter of irrelevant or misleading life experiences, theories, facts, intuition, strategies, algorithms, heuristics, metaphors, and hunches that regrettably have the look and feel of useful and accurate knowledge. Uh, and that's exactly, you know, the point of all of this. We will, without meaning to, come to conclusions that we know things about the world or about specific um, fields of study without meaning to, just because we live our lives and have experiences and we draw conclusions, regardless of how well equipped we are to make those conclusions. So how does it relate to vaccine hesitancy? So this is a quote I've often used, um, courtesy of Dr. Joel, who started giving these talks with Boost initially, that I really like. Vaccines are brimming with toxins. These include dozens of chemicals, heavy metals, and allergens. Um, so this comes from an anti-vaccination website. And it's a really interesting quote because, I mean, it sums up very clearly what a lot of families will hear. A lot of, I mean, anybody will hear if you just Google vaccines and start looking at information on them. There's a lot of misinformation. And this is the kind of things that will come up. And it has the look and feel of something intelligible, of something genuine. But this statement is complete nonsense. Um, if you have a basic knowledge of, you know, the periodic table, you know what a chemical is, you know what metals and allergens are and toxins are, you think you understand these things, you just have this negative connotation, then it makes sense that, okay, vaccines are bringing with toxins, they have all these chemicals, metals and allergens, therefore they must be bad. But that doesn't actually make any sense. Um, if you have a little bit more knowledge, then you can apply it to this statement and see that it's bunk. Toxins is a meaningless term. Literally everything can be a toxin. Oxygen, water, and food are all toxic to you if you have them in too much of a concentration. Chemicals, everything is a chemical. Anything can be written in a chemical formula. Heavy metals, those can be bad for you, but there aren't actually any heavy metals in, in vaccines. Aluminum is in some vaccines, that's not a heavy metal. Uh, thimerosal broken down into mercury, also not a heavy metal and not harmful in the concentrations of that in a vaccine. Um, and then allergens. Again, anything can be an allergen. An allergen is anything that your body creates an inappropriate immune response to. And yes, you can be allergic to a vaccine, just like you can be allergic to a food or a textile or anything else. But the rates of allergic reaction to vaccines are very low. It varies by vaccine, but it's about one in a million or so, give or take, for um, the specific vaccine you're talking about. So with enough knowledge, you can really realize how much this statement doesn't mean anything. But if you have a more basic knowledge uh, and you haven't studied extensively misinformation uh, and medicine and the human body as a physician like I have, then you might not be able to really extrapolate all of that. So how do we talk to families about vaccines given that this is what we're dealing with? These are the kind of biases we're dealing with. Basically, we don't really know. We don't have great data. This was a, a study from 2014. They concluded, uh, based on a meta-analysis of how to have effective conversations, that there's a lack of evidence with, with effective strategies to increase vaccine uptake for parents, uh, for children of vaccine-hesitant parents. We don't really know what works really well. What we do know providing factual information doesn't change intent. I can I could sit in front of a, a parent who says, I don't want to vaccinate and tell them all the reasons that they should, all the facts about it, that's not going to have any statistical chance of trying of changing their intent to vaccinate. 
Um, if I provide more emotional information, like, you know, vaccines are helpful preventing the diseases, diseases are scary, you need to make sure you're avoiding them, that's only going to increase fear. It doesn't increase vaccination. Um, it will actually just in lead to more decision paralysis, which is kind of what happens in the first place. Vaccinating is a choice and not vaccinated is a choice. And if you don't make that choice, then you are choosing not to vaccinate. And if you are paralyzed by fear, then your choice is not to vaccinate. So fear-based messaging is one, it's not, it's not emotionally supportive. It doesn't make people feel good. And two, it doesn't help with helping them feel comfortable with the vaccination decision. And then talking about community to the benefits, uh, or benefits to the community um, is not usually going to change the intent of a parent to vaccinate because understandably a parent's first concern is the health of their own child and that's going to be um, foremost before they start thinking about the health of other people's children and if they think that they're sacrificing their own child's health by vaccinating then it doesn't matter how much perceived benefit there is to the community. So these are things that, that don't work. So why don't these kind of facts work? A real good summary of that is what's called motivated reasoning. The information that we hear and see in the day is filtered by our brains through our own sacrosanct beliefs, the things that we hold um, as the most important views that we have. So it means if we hear something that aligns with our own worldviews and our own sense of self, we're probably going to believe it. If we hear things that challenge those views, we're either going to ignore it not be able to uh, comprehend it, or we're going to reinterpret the facts in a way that makes sense with what we already believe um, in, you know, in our own identity. So what are sacrosanct beliefs? There's two main types of them. There's foundational beliefs, which are the beliefs we have about who we are. Um, and these are pretty common ones here. Most people think I'm a good person. Most people think they're well informed. Most people think uh, say that they believe they're making decisions in the best interests of their children. And most parents believe that they know what's best for their children and for themselves. Uh, political and ideological beliefs. These are also really commonly sacrosanct beliefs, especially in the United States. Um, and they become very relevant to public health in the last year or so in the wake of the pandemic um, and more vaccine hesitancy as that's been politicized as well. So ideas like corporations are selfish and evil. Um, there can be truth to some of this, but it can become a sacrosanct belief when that becomes a defining view of how people interpret the world around them. Um, experts and the government can't be trusted. Um, again, definitely some truth to some of that, but not always true, certainly not true in many circumstances. Natural is better. This is a common natural fallacy, um, but very commonly held. My rights are more important than my responsibilities. These are things that, that's something that some people might not always say, but definitely something we know is true. Um, and you can tell from uh, the demonstrations of people who refuse to wear masks in the wake of COVID. I mean, this is, this is kind of foremost there. It's the idea of their personal freedom, their personal rights are more important than, you know, their perceived, the responsibility to protect other people around them. Medical interventions are excessive and harmful. Definitely true in many instances, but not true all the time. And this can become very dangerous when it becomes something that, um, that a patient refers to as, as their defining guidance for how they make decisions. And then simple and familiar things are safer. Unknown and complicated things are dangerous. Very, very true. Um, a very important uh, reason behind uh, some of the tribalism that we see. Um, not tribalism in terms of uh, the tribes we're, we're serving, but tribalism in terms of, of racism and nationalism and things like that. Um, so a very important concept and also important when it comes to vaccines because those are often perceived as foreign or complicated or not easily understood. So if we if we then filter the way that we are that are we are messaging to patients, the way the ways we're talking to patients through their sacrosanct beliefs, you say something like, "You should vaccinate your child because vaccines are safe and will protect them from the disease." And a lot of parents will reinterpret that and hear, "You're misinformed. You're endangering your child. I'm an expert. I know what's best for your child, and you should inject this unnatural chemical created by pharmaceutical companies and pushed by the government into your pure child's body." And for parents who hear that, what they're, they're hearing is a contradiction of multiple of their own sacrosanct beliefs. That you know that they know best for your child. You're saying they don't. That they know they're well informed. You're saying they're not. Um, that um, 
you're endangering their child um, and they which they don't believe they are and so they will either not hear what you're saying or refuse to believe what you're saying or reinterpret what you've said be, to align with um, uh, with something that is more in line with what they believe and what they hold to be true so how do we talk effectively so this is where the motivational interview approach comes in um, this has been used successfully for many other um, aspects of, of public health, and it can be used for vaccines as well. So general principles of motivational interviewing as it's applied to vaccines. Step one, don't try to convince parents to vaccinate. Obviously, I want all my patients to vaccinate their kids, but my goal when I talk to parents is not to get them to say, okay, I'll vaccinate. It's to get them to tell me what they feel and believe about vaccines and how they want to proceed with vaccines and then help them feel comfortable with their decision, help them to understand their decision and their reasoning and to ask questions that I can answer. So I want to convince them that I care about their child, that I believe that that parent is trying to keep their child safe um, so that they can, we can have that trust that everyone's been talking about, which is the, the cornerstone of a successful conversation. So I find out what their sacrosanct beliefs are, what they think is true and what they identify with. And then I speak to those beliefs. I try not to just uh, refute a wrong idea. Um, if someone says, well, I think that vaccines cause autism. Well, I could say, well, here's you know, how, you know, a few hundred studies that have been done that say, no, they don't cause autism. That's not gonna help. I have to understand why they believe that, how they came to that decision, and then assess their willingness to learn alternate information and more accurate information. Um, so to break this down into steps, step one, listen to why parents don't want to vaccinate. Ask them why. Don't assume that, they, that you know why they don't wanna vaccinate, but ask what has led you to this decision and assess kind of their readiness to change because some people are not gonna to wanna to have a conversation at all and other people are gonna be very interested to learn more and a lot of people are gonna be somewhere in the middle and they're all gonna have their own unique reasons, their own experiences, things that they've expressed, uh, you know, as Roberta mentioned with their own kiddos or with family members or friends or things that they've read or heard from other people. So figure out where they're getting information and what is informing their views so you can have a, a meaningful conversation. People need to be listened to before they will be, you know, wanting to listen to anything that contradicts what you're, what you're telling, what they believe. Um, and then you have to validate, you have to empathize. So you have to actually, once they've they've told you how they feel, make sure they know that you've listened, that you're not just trying to, you know, go through a stepwise process like this, you're not trying to check boxes, but that you understand what they're saying and why, and that you understand why they feel the way they do, and try to actually feel that. And it's, it can be hard to do on a, on a broad general level when we talk about the statistics and the millions of parents who aren't vaccinating and the resulting outbreaks and things, but on an individual level, when you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a patient, um, I always find it very easy to understand because it's clear to me when I speak with these patients, they are trying to do what's best for their kiddos. And so if I can understand things from that perspective and through that lens, it makes the conversation much more helpful. It's also helpful to talk about and acknowledge things that make, make us proud. So talking to parents about the things that they are proud of about themselves, um, that can help them feel more willing and ready to accept information that contradicts other things that they believe. So after all of this, that's when it's time to start to educate. And, and I've modified this from what I used to say. I think the important thing here is asking permission. So I say, I strongly recommend getting vaccines according to the CDC schedule. I wanna make sure you feel comfortable with your decisions. So is it okay if I share some information that other parents have found helpful? I think this is a great way to start the conversation um, or rather continue the conversation because some parents are just not gonna be interested. They're gonna say, you know what? No, I'm good, I don't want to. And that's fine, it's important to respect that. And also it's a good reason to move on because if they're in that position, it's usually not gonna be worthwhile to spend your time trying to talk with them when they've made their mind up. Um, very few parents are in that position. Many parents are willing to say, actually, no, I do have questions. I would like to learn more. Please, can you tell me? And then you get that permission and you can share the information they want to hear that they've agreed to hear. So um, I'm gonna go briefly over some basic concepts about vaccine information that is helpful to share for parents. Um, so this is a, uh, a representation of how the immune system sees disease. Um, and this is not how vaccines uh, or diseases actually work, but I think it's a common misconception. So 
the idea that disease, a disease comes to your body, causes symptoms, the immune system sees that and then creates some kind of natural immunity as opposed to vaccines directly, artificially activating your immune system and leading to artificial immunity and autoimmune disease. Um, this I think is a common perception based on the way a lot of parents will talk about vaccines being some kind of unnatural way to um, you know, uh, ramp up the immune system in harmful ways. Uh, what's actually happening is when your disease gets to your body, your immune system sees it and it creates the symptoms that you get. So the fever to try to kill the disease, the diarrhea to try to get it out, um, or the immunity that you build through immune cells. And then in some instances, autoimmune disease. When you make a vaccine, you try to take the parts of the disease that you want and remove the parts that you don't want so that all you get is the immune system response creating immunity with minimal or no impact creating any kind of autoimmune disease or, uh, or symptoms. So a couple of basic ways to make a vaccine. One is you take a disease like this where it's got these shapes, these red shapes on the side of it, which represent the proteins or sugars that are the antibodies that your body sees, or sorry, the antigens that your body sees and then creates the anti, uh, antibodies to the blue shapes here um, that will connect to those shapes and create an immune response, create the symptoms of illness, and then in some cases create autoimmune complications if they also match other receptors. Um, so one way to make a vaccine is to simply take part of the disease that you want to, to make an immunity to, the part that would create an immune response but not um, disease or illness, and then you just inject that part only. So you get a vaccine with only the, um, the antigen that is required to make an immune response, and you'll either kill the rest of the vaccine or isolate that part of it only, and, and you have your, uh, your vaccine. Another way to do it is to use a live virus that you selectively breed to create something that is not harmful for humans. So this, I like to analogize with the way we've tamed dogs. All dogs are Canis lupus. They used to be wolves. We gave them love and attention and selected them for the friendliest and the cutest and the cuddliest or the most reliable uh, at hunting or whatever we wanted them for. And then we made these awesome pets that I've got one in my house and I'm not scared of it at all, but it's the same breed as a wolf. But this is what we do with things like the measles, mumps, and rubella, the live attenuated viruses. We filter them through petri dishes, through various different types of cell media until they become a attenuated version of the virus that is no longer harmful to humans, but carries those same antigens that will create immunity. Uh, vaccines are not made by some unnatural synthetic process whereby we have some synthetic chemical made in a vat to create some new compound never before seen with these new proteins that aren't found in nature that cause autoimmune complications. The things in a vaccine are all found naturally in nature and they're not going to cause anything that you would not already be at risk from from the disease or the individual uh, adjuvants which are overwhelmingly the safest things we um, can be exposed to. Um, briefly addressing a few misconceptions, uh, profitableness of vaccines. This is often seen as a reason to mistrust physicians and healthcare providers um, and the pharmaceutical companies, which do deserve a, a sheer fare of mistrust in many instances. Um, but vaccines are actually not very profitable. So this is one of my favorite graphs. Children's vaccines represent that brown bar on the left side. They work maybe 200 million or so a year versus the rest of the sales from the pharmaceutical industry are well over $400 billion annually. And this is a few years old now, so this is even higher now. Um, so if you were trying to make a profit off of a medication and you didn't care about who you were trying to dupe or you were trying to conspire in order to make as much money without um, care for the consequences, it wouldn't make sense to go through all that effort to try to sell vaccines because there's minimal money in it. It would be make much more sense to do some other kind of drug and even more so to pursue a drug in the alternative medicine industry, which still makes uh, many times more money uh, or profit than the uh, children's vaccines, but has significantly less regulation. Vaccines are the most highly and tightly regulated um, medical intervention that we have. So it's much more challenging to, to falsify data or to um, take shortcuts in the manufacturing process compared to other medicines. 
And then another common con uh, concept of how much is too much, are we giving too many vaccines? And you'll see, see information like this related to this idea that there, you know, 49 doses, 14 vaccines, that's, that's so many. Um, and the truth is this isn't that many. This is a common tactic employed in, in all sorts of misinformation to provide information without context. So the context missing here is the denominator of that number of antigens. So we, for 49 doses, 14 vaccines, that's not a lot. This is how many um, antigens that you are exposed to um, by month on average in, in, throughout life, that orange bar there, the brown, or the orange graph. The bar, brown at the bottom represents the antigens you're exposed to in vaccines. It's a little over 200 over the first two years of life. So it's a fraction of what you're exposed to just through living, through eating, breathing, and sleeping, and, and kids' cases rolling around on the floor and putting things in your mouth you get a lot more exposure to antigens just from being alive than from all the vaccines combined. And in fact, the number of antigens we have in vaccines is um, a fraction of what it used to be in the 60s, about uh, over 2000 or so, because we are just better at making vaccines now. So we can give a significant smaller amount of antigen than we used to be able to. Um, so I wanna transition now into talking more about the flu vaccine. Um, so this is a similar graph to do what Dr. Weiser had shared. This, that was, uh, I think, the I, uh, IHS data. This is national data from the CDC by year from 2011 to 2019. And you'll see it, it fairly closely mirrors what we saw from Dr. Weiser, that this is uh, flu vaccination rates are low. And this is um, on the bottom, those two light gray lines are for adults. Um, and the reason there's two bars is because it's from different data collection systems, um, so different estimates. The darker bars on the top are children. So as pediatricians, we do do a better job than adults in getting, uh, getting our kids vaccinated, so yay us. But you'll see it, it's still low. I mean, it has been trending up a little, which is great, from 51 and 38% in 2011 to 62 and 45% in 2019. Um, but this is still pretty abysmal if you think about, you know, the 80 to 95% rates that we go for for routine childhood immunizations. So why are these rates so low? There's a few reasons. One is the vaccine is, does not work as well. And this is, uh, ironically, this is reason why it's not gotten as much and also reason why it's more necessary. Um, the average efficacy for a flu vaccine is 40 to 60% among the overall population when in years where the circulating viruses are well matched to the vaccine. So it's, it's not great compared to you know, the 99% effectiveness of the MMR, for example. Um, it also requires annual vaccination, which is rough. If you only had to get it one time, a lot more people would get it. If you have to get it every single year, then every year is a chance to not get it. And it becomes more cumbersome. It seems less meaningful. Um, and it's more chances to have a side effect, which after you've had a side effect, you might not want to get it again. Um, other reasons are regression to the mean, recall bias, negativity bias, the idea that you get this vaccine in the fall, early fall, before winter has come, before you start getting all the colds of the winter season, before you've gotten the flu, um, while you're still feeling happy and healthy because of summer, before the seasonal affective disorder that we all get in Portland kicks in. So you get it at a time where things are great, and then right afterwards, you go into a winter where things are not that great, and things are more stressful, and you're more commonly sick. And so we have bad associations with the influenza vaccine. There's also these common things that you'll, you've probably heard, I hear this all the time, I've never gotten the vaccine and I've never gotten the flu, or the, this idea that the flu isn't a big deal. So how do we discuss these problems with patients? First step is be honest. So there's truth to some of those things, there's misinformation to some of those things. So there are concerns that parents have that correct. Um, the effectiveness is not great compared to other vaccines. So when parents say, I don't think it works that well, say, you're right, it doesn't work that well compared to other vaccines. But 40% effectiveness is still amazing compared to 0%. That if you could tell me that I'm half as likely to get sick, I would still want to take that intervention. So you have to compare it to what the alternative is. Is you, Would you rather have 40% protection or 0% protection? And that's the important thing to keep in mind. Um, I also like to say that the science behind the flu vaccine is the same as the science behind other vaccines. So if you trust re, you know, the routine childhood vaccinations, there's no reason not to trust the flu vaccine. It's the same what science, the same vaccinology, the same field of study, and there's, it's the same way that it works. Um, vaccine side effects are not dangerous. 
flu is dangerous. Um, now, of course, you can have severe allergic reactions and things like that, but again, that's about one in a million people, and people do not die of flu or have long-term consequences of flu vaccine in the United States. Flu, on the other hand, very much dangerous. Um, acknowledge that, you know, a lot of parents, for a lot of people, it's true that they may never have gotten the flu and despite never getting the flu vaccine. And that's true because most people in a given year are not going to get flu vaccine. Most of the country are not, we're not going to get flu. Most of the country are not going to get sick with the flu every year. So if you just roll the dice, you're probably not going to get sick, but millions of people will get sick. So know the disease burden. This is incredibly important. I think a lot of people don't, they fail to realize how serious the flu is. These are similar numbers to, to, to what Dr. Weiser has shared as well, but this is national data from the CDC, again, from 2011 to 2018. And you can see each year it shows the bottom of the pyramid is the total number of flu cases. So from 9 million to 45 million people. Every year, up to 45 million people get sick with flu. And that's, a, that's just total. So if you get a mild case of flu, and a mild case of flu is worse than the worst cold you could ever get, and it is horrible, and you're going to be home from school or work for a week, and it's, it's miserable. I had a mild case of flu last year, and it was absolutely awful. So it's not, it's not something minor. If, I, if you can prevent it, you should prevent it. But in addition to that, you get hundreds of thousands up to, you know, between it says 140,000 in 2011 to the top here, we have uh, 810,000 in 2018 hospitalizations. So that's hundreds of thousands of people who are in the hospital because of how sick they are, where they might need to be intubated, they might need to go on uh, things like ECMO, they'll have, at the very least, they'll have lines and tubes in them, they can get complications of pneumonia and encephalitis. And then on top of that, you've got the tens of thousands of people, you know, 30 to, to 50,000, 60,000 people a year dying because of flu. That's deaths that don't need to happen. This is a summary of the data up until the 2018 season from 2010, averaging between all years. So you get 9 million to 45 million illnesses, 140 to 810,000 hospitalizations, and 12,000 to 61,000 deaths. Every single year, we have these number of people dying. And we know that this year, it's going to be about the same. It could be a lot worse, in fact, because of the burden of the healthcare system. So these are things that are happening, people who are dying unnecessarily every single year. So it's not mild. And I don't say that, that you should use this information to scare parents, but you do need to make sure that they know that this is a real thing. This is a problem, and it's not something to take lightly. So Moving on a little to vaccinations in the wake of COVID. So this was touched on as well. This is another graph from CDC of national um, vaccination rates, um, non-flu doses versus measles containing doses. And you can see that it's been pretty bad. We saw a drop, a, a slight drop after the first case of COVID in the US on January 20th, and then a much steeper drop on March 13th after the national emergency was declared after an excessive delay. And since then, we've continued to drop. Now, you can see on this bottom graph that the dark blue bars, which is kids under two years, those rates have been increasing again slightly, which again reflects that pediatricians are awesome at their jobs, and we've been doing a good job of trying to reach out to families and do take all the measures um, that Allison had mentioned earlier about trying to make sure we're increasing our vaccination rates. So that's awesome for us, but they're still low. We still have work to do. Dr. Hassan, we probably yeah. have to uh, wind up here so people have a chance to ask you questions. Oh, sure, sure. Um, okay, well, I can go ahead and um, skip ahead here. Basically, bottom line, vaccines are more important now than they were before because we are more at risk for preventable disease and for a flu pandemic and because the burden of the healthcare system is going to be uh, horrendous um, with two, two pandemics. And then I had a little information about a COVID-19 vaccine going over uh, phase trials, but I will, uh, I'll skip that for now and we can just uh, see what questions people have. Great, thank you. I, I, I think we could have gone on. Uh, not, uh, not as many folks have dropped us as I thought. We tried to keep it between um, 12 and one, but this is our first try at it. So if folks have questions, if they go want to go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Hassan or Dr. Weiser. So has there been an, uh, a new, what were you saying, Richie? My husband was saying, um, has there been asking if there has been a new like release of updated immunizations? When's the last time that, that there's been this new revamp 
of immunizations? I know you just said it's been a little bit. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Could you, could you ask again? Yeah, like a, a new recipe. You said an updated, like you, back in the 60s or whatever, you had uh, different volumes oh, of, I see, I see. Of, of different components that are in the immunizations. So you don't have any new ones that are out now that are just like been recently released in the last three years or something. I think right. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, last three years, no. Um, I, I couldn't tell you offhand the the last um, time that, you know, particular vaccine was licensed. Um, generally, the it it was much more common in this in the early part of the 20th century to have um, a lots of changes to um, uh, to vaccine recipes, and that was because it was a new science. We weren't very good at it. Um, there's a really great book called Vaccinated by Paul Offit. Um,